Lecture five begins the theme of chapter three is collision and contact of particle to particle and the particle to wall. In general, the analytical model for collision and contact are classified into the hard sphere model and the soft sphere model. The hard sphere model is sometimes called rigid particle model. Lecture five and six describe this model. The soft sphere model is sometimes called the elastic particle model. The new numerical calculation using the soft sphere model is called distinct element method or shortly DEM. <clears throat> the soft sphere model and the DEM are described in lecture seven. <clears throat> Let's begin with part to world collision using the hard sphere model. <clears throat> Before explain, explaining the hard sphere model, I will speak about the interaction between the particle and the wall. There are two kinds of particle to wall interactions, hydrodynamic interaction and solid mechanics, mechanical interaction. <clears throat> When a particle near the wall moves in the fluid parallel to the wall, the lift force acts on the particle in addition to the drag force. Because the velocity gradient of fluid becomes large near the wall. This is hydrodynamic interaction. <clears throat> the lift force was explained in detail in lecture three. When a particle rapidly approaches the wall in the normal direction a force that blocks the proximity of the particle act on the particles it is usually called lubrication this is also hydrodynamic interaction solid mechanical interaction is a collision or contact between the particle and the wall in the case of the flying particle, the particle will adhere to the wall. <clears throat> In this case, the coefficient of restitution is zero. <clears throat> From now, let's drive the relation between the pre and post velocity in collision. Consider three dimensional motion of a spherical particle in collision. Both the translation velocity v and angular velocity omega have three components x, y, and z. The superscript z is attached to the pre collision symbols. The superscript 2 is attached to the post collision symbols. In addition to the superscript, zero and two, there are other superscript used. You will see such superscript later. <clears throat> the assumptions shown in the yellow frame are used in the analysis of lecture five. The assumption one is as follows. During the entire period of collision, the deformation of the sphere is negligible because it is regarded as a rigid body and the distance between the sphere center and the contact point is constant and equal to the radius A. The assumption too is that Coulomb's friction law is applied to particles sliding along the wall. The assumption three is that once a particle stops sliding, it will not slide again. <clears throat> Many symbols are used in this analysis. The main symbols are shown in this slide. Please note the following point. When the sphere touches the wall, the vector R is used 
or the vector drawn from the sphere gravity center to the contact point. The magnitude of the vector r is small a. The Greek symbol mu is used, usually used for fluid viscosity, but in lecture five and six, it is used as friction coefficient. <clears throat> the figure shows the translation velocity and angular velocity of a particle colliding the wall. These velocities have three components, x, y, and z. The rigid particle model uses the restitution coefficient e. There are few different definitions of the restitution coefficient. The definition used so far will be shown below. <clears throat> definition one is the ratio of the, of the absolute values of the velocity vector before and after the collision. Definition two is the ratio of the vertical component of the velocity before and after the collision. Definition three, define the restitution coefficient for each of the x and y components. Before explaining definition four, let's take a closer look at the process in detail when the particle collides with the wall. Particle having the translational and the angular velocities approaches the wall. The particle contacts the wall. The particle and the wall are deformed. The direction of movement is reversed. The deformation still remains. The moment when the particle leaves the wall, the deformation disappears and both the particle and the wall return to their original shapes. The particle moves away from the wall. The above description is the whole collision process. The particles is, the particle is compressed on the left side and recovered on the right side. Therefore, the left side is called compression period. The right side is called recovery period. The impulse acting on the particle during the compression period is J1. And impulse acting on the particle during the recovery period is J2. The impulse is the force multiplied by the time during which the force acts. The restitution coefficient in definition four is defined as the ratio of the impulse of the compression period to the recovery period. Definition four is most rational. If the part is a sphere, the definition four reduces to the definition two. In this lecture, the definition four is adapted. <clears throat> Again, consider the case where a particle having translation velocity and angular velocity collide diagonally with the flat plate. Assume that the particle is a sphere. This figure is drawn two dimensionally, but actually both translation velocity and angular velocity are vectors and have three directional components. First, the part approaches the wall surface and collides. Finally, the part move, moves away from the wall. As shown in the previous slide, why the particle contact, both the particle and the wall deformed. After the deformation reaches its maximum, the deformation begins to decrease.
In addition to repartition, friction must be considered in the analysis. Depending on the magnitude of the friction force, the particle either continue to slide or stop sliding on the way. So the analysis should be divided into three cases. Case one, in case one, the sliding motion stops somewhere in the compression period. In case two, the particle stops sliding in the recovery period. In case three, the particle, particle continue to slide throughout the compression and recovery period. The subsequent analysis is based on the velocity of the particle surface on the wall. Therefore, first, the formula representing the surface velocity vector large u is shown in the yellow frame. The surface velocity u is the sum of the translation velocity v and vector product of radius vector and angular velocity vector. <clears throat> the radius vector has only one component of y direction, so the vector product of vector r and vector omega does not have the y component. I have explained the vector product in lecture two. <clears throat> Let's start with the case one analysis. The collision process is divided into four periods. That is pre-collision period, compression period, recovery period, and post-collision period. The compression period is divided into the sliding period and not, not sliding period. The change of Translational velocity and angular velocity in each period is shown in this figure. The symbols with the superscript zero is those of pre collision. The superscript S means the end of sliding period. The superscript one means the end of compression period. The superscript two means the end of the recovery period. JS is the impulse acting on the particle during the sliding period. JR is the impulse of the compression period after the sliding period. J2 is the impulse of the recovery period. J1 is the sum of JR and JS. <clears throat> the final goal is to find the relationship between the velocity before and after the collision. <clears throat> before the goal, the velocities of each period must be solved. For that purpose, impulsive equation is used. <clears throat> that is the difference in momentum between the beginning and end of each period is equal to the impulse and difference in angular, velocity, angular momentum is equal to the moment of the impulse. The difference in momentum and angular momentum between the beginning and the end of the sliding period can be expressed by these equations. For your reference, some symbols are shown below. The difference in momentum and angular momentum between the end of sliding period and the end of the compression period can be expressed by these equations. The difference in momentum and angular momentum between the beginning and the end of recovery period can be expressed by these equations. The given data are particle radius, 
particle mass restitution coefficient and friction coefficient. The final goal is to solve V2 and omega 2 as the functions of V0 and omega 0. Before reaching the final goal, many unknown variables must be solved on the way, such as the impulse, velocity, at the end of the sliding period and at the end of compression period. Since the motion is three-dimensional, all components in the X, Y, and Z direction are unknown variables. Therefore, a large number of unknown variables must be solved, treated and solved. Fortunately, it does not require advanced mathematical knowledge because all the equations are simple linear algebraic equations. The velocity treated in the analysis below is the velocity of the contact point of particle with the wall. That velocity has been given in the previous, previous slide. The same equation is shown on the first line. <coughs> Next, I will explain the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are given at the end of each period. <coughs> Equations of boundary condition are shown in the right. At the end of sliding period, the sliding velocity is zero. At the end of the compression period, that is the turning point, not only the sliding velocity, but also the vertical velocity component is zero. The boundary condition at the end of recovery period, the same as at the end of the compression period. That is the sliding period, sliding velocity equals zero. Note that vertical component Vy does not become zero even if the particle contact the wall surface. It becomes zero at the turning point of the compression period and recovery period. From the definition of restitution coefficient E, the Y component of impulse and the recovery period can be expressed by the Y component of impulse in the compression period. The impulse in the compression period is the sum of JYS and JYR. from the Coulomb's friction law applied to the sliding period, the X and the Z component of impulse in the sliding period can be expressed by the Y component of impulse in the same period. The frictional force can be obtained by multiplying the, the impulse in Y direction by the friction coefficient. But it's necessary to divide it, divide it into the component in the X and Z direction. So the direction cosine is used for that purpose. By solving the algebraic equation, by combining the above equation and impact equation, the post translational velocity V2 and the post angular velocity with two omega two can be obtained. However, the ex explanation of the in induction process is omitted here. Please do it by yourself. Many equations must be handling hundred, but each one is not difficult. If it is hard for you to fully understand the explanation here, in a short time, I encourage you to watch the video 
repeatedly and take a total look and listen. Next, I will explain case two. The end of sliding period is in the, in the recovery period. The analysis of the, for, uh, for case two is basically the same as for case one. The transition of translational velocity and angular velocity in each period is shown. The meaning of the superscript of zero, one, S and two are the same as in case one. The, the impulse in each period is shown in the table. J1 is the impulse in the compression period. The impulse from the beginning of the recovery period to the end of the sliding period is JS. The impulse in the rest of the recovery period is JR. Total impulse in the recovery period is, uh, is the sum of JS and JR. Next, I will show the impulse equation in each period. The first one are those for the compression period. The second impulse equation are those from the beginning of the recovery period to the end of the sliding period. The third impulse equation are those from the end of the sliding period to the end of the recovery period. In case three, the particle continues to slide throughout, throughout the compression and recovery period. Analysis is easier because there is no need to distinguish between sliding period and non-sliding period. The transition of translation velocity and angular velocity as shown. The impulses that respond, respond to changes in velocity are also taken into account. The impulsive equation are given like this. <clears throat> the result of case one, two, and three are shown together regarding Regarding the pre and the post collision velocity and angular velocity, the result for case one and case two are eventually the same and shown in the left column. The result of case three are shown in the right column. Which case hold is determined by the above inequality? Next, I will explain irregular bouncing. In the actual phenomenon, all the bouncing motion of a particle with a wall are more or less irregular. For the convenience of theoretical treatment, the particle shape is often assumed to be a sphere. If the spherical particle with the restitution coefficient less than one moves in the horizontal pipe or channel under the gravity and collide repeated, repeatedly with the wall, the sphere will eventually lose its vertical velocity and continue to slide on the wall. Previously, previously the effect of the fluid, such as lift force and turbulence, were assumed as the force, forces by which the sphere maintain floating motion. For coarse particles or force spheres, the fluid force is not enough to keep the sphere away from the wall. Now it is known that the mechanism preventing the coarse particle from being caught on the wall is irregular bouncing. There are two analytical methods for handling irregular bouncing. The one is to consider a roughness and an evenness of the world. And the other is to make the particle shape non-spherical. In reality, these two are happening at the same time, but it is sufficient to use 
either method for calculation. <clears throat> the illustration shows the modeling of irregular bouncing. The upper illustration shows the unevenness of the wall surface, and the lower illustration shows the bouncing of a non spherical particle. When the sphere collides with an even wall, what is required in calculation is to tilt the wall at an appropriate angle. The lower illustration shows the bouncing motion of a non spherical particle. The reflection angle theta out is not always larger than the instant angle theta in, depending on which position, which point of particle hit the wall surface. But if the probability that the reflection angle theta out is larger than instant angle theta E is, say, 50%, and then regular bouncing prevents the core particle from sliding on the wall. <clears throat> I will explain the collision of non spherical particle on the wall. For simplicity, consider the two dimensional case. The axis of rotation is normal to the paper. Even in the three-dimensional case, the rotation, rotation around x-axis and y-axis can be ignored if the x component of particle translation velocity is large. In the case of a sphere, the vector drawn from the gravity center to the contact point C on the wall is normal to the wall and its length is constant because the length is equal to the sphere radius A. The vector R has only Y component. In the case of non-sphere, the vector drawn from the gravity center to the contact point of C is not necessarily normal to the wall and its length is not constant depending on the attitude at the collision moment. The vector R has an X component in addition to the Y component. <clears throat> and the impulsive equation must be derived by considering the above factor. The equation system becomes complicated, but the explana explanation of the impression expression is omitted here. In, in particle fluid march phase load, particle fly while rotating. It may be possible to calculate the attitude of non spherical particle at the moment of collision if the number of the particle and the frequency of increase in collision increases. The computational load will become enormous. It is wise to use random number to give attitude at random. This slide will explain the such method. First, draw many lines radially from the part gravity center towards the periphery. In this picture, the number of line is 12. Take the tangent to the particle surface vertically from each line. Each tangent corresponds to the wall. The line connecting the gravity center and the contact point is vector R. In order to see the irregularity of the motion of a non spherical particle bouncing on the wall, my group, Osaka University, conducted a simple numerical experiment. In the numerical experiment, we made a particle drop naturally from the above on the inclined plate a number of times. The trajectory of each trial was calculated. Trajectory of all trials are shown in the right figure. The path diameter was five millimeter. The height from the initial position to the falling point 
for 20 centimeters. The restitution coefficient and the friction coefficient are assumed to be 0 0.93 and 0 0.28 respectively. These values correspond to the case where a polyethylene particle collide with acrylic plate. The shape of the non-sphere used in this numerical experiment is compared with that of true sphere in the left figure. As shown in the figure, the difference between the true sphere and non-sphere is very small. But the trajectory of non-sphere fluctuates remarkably. <clears throat> Before this numerical experiment, I measured particle trajectory in the same condition as this numerical experiment. As long as I saw the particle shape by naked eye, it looks a uh, true sphere. In that measurement, I experienced large fluctuation of trajectory. From the physical experiment and numerical experiment, I was able to confirm that even if the particle looks spherical, slight deviation of the particle shape from the true sphere cannot be ignored in the particle tracking calculation of the horizontal flow. Finally, I will compare the calculated trajectory of pneumatically transported particle in horizontal channel with and without irregular bouncing. The condition given to the calculation are as follows. Part diameter is 1.1 millimeter. The restitution coefficient is 0 0.93. The friction coefficient mu is 0 0.28 and the channel height is h is 25 millimeter the first result is the one when the irregular bounce is ignored and air velocity is 15 meter per second in this figure the height scale is so magnified that the particle appears to bounce bounce off like a rabbit if the same length scale is applied to the flow and height, the movement of particle is nearly horizontal. As expected, the particle repeat bouncing motion, but eventually move on the bottom wall. This result is unrealistic in the case of air velocity of 15 meters per sec. The second result is though when the irregular bounce is taken into account, that is the particle are non spherical, but difference from spherical particle shape is the same as has been shown in the previous slide. The length scale of the height direction is magnified in the same way as in the first figure. In the upper case, the air velocity is 7, seven meter per sec and in the lower case, the air velocity is 50 meter per sec. It is, it, it is found that a small non-sphericity non prevents the particle from getting caught on the wall. This result means that it's essential to consider irregular bouncing in numerical calculation that track the motion of individual particles. This is the end of lecture six. Thank you.